Welcome to New Day Cleveland. I'm Natalie Herbeck and David's going to be joining me in the show today. We are at a pretty spectacular place in Lakewood, a building that was built in the early 1900s. It's known to a lot of you as the Screw Factory, but it's also known as the Lake Erie Building. And there are a lot of artists hard at work here. We are really excited to show you this place and I have with me here a man who's going to help us out just a bit. This is the facility manager, Ralph. Nice to see you, Ralph. Nice to see you as well. So I know that there is a lot going on in this building. For those who might not be as familiar with it, what all happens here? Well, pretty much everything under the sun. <laughs> uh, we, we're in the artist area now, and uh, uh, we have uh, probably about 40 artists in the building. Um, but we have everything in the building from a CrossFit gym, a yoga, a Pilates studio, to heavy industrial tenants on the first floor. Um, so. You name it, we have it in this. Uh, it's a pretty eclectic uh, environment. So I know we're kind of focusing on the artist aspect mm -hmm. of the building today. And th those are the ones who really kind of encompass this is the screw factory, right? Exactly Where do right. the names come about? Uh, well, originally uh, Lake Erie Screw Corporation was uh, in the building from the 1950s through 2005. And they made fasteners or screws. So they just uh, coined the, the name screw factory artist because they thought it was catchy. So. It That's is catchy. A, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, but the, the Lake Erie Valley, I know you said on the first floor, there's a lot of industrial mm -hmm. space that's used. Sure. We have um, Ferry Cap and Set Screw, uh, Hawthorne Wire Services, Lake Erie Industries, Euclid Wire and Steel, Bazetta Steel Processing, 717 Inc. Oh, you got and, a lot uh, in so here. We have uh, over 90 tenants in the building. So. And with the artists, I mean, you can come in here by appointment mm -hmm. and get some of the great works of art. Actually, yeah, you can contact the artist, make an appointment and come in and buy some of their works. Then we also have uh, uh, the artists organize three shows a year, a spring show, a fall show and a holiday show where the uh, building is open to the public and they can come in and shop. Uh, and we also have many outside uh, vendors or artists in at those particular times as well to give a wide selection of uh, uh, items to purchase. There's a lot going on here. There's so much to explore. So what do you say? We should get started, right? Absolutely. We're going to send it off to David first. As you walk through the screw factory, you'll hear a similar story from folks over and over again. This gave them a second career. They spent a lot of years doing their first job, their first career, but their passion led them here. I'm what you call a glass fusing artist, which means that I'm, I don't blow glass, but I layer glass and then I fuse it in a kiln. So one of the things about glass fusing that's so exciting to many artists is that if you have a background in uh, stained glass, you have to connect everything with lead canes. But when you fuse, you can cut things out and have shapes, and then you fuse them together, and so you're not constricted in that way. I hung out with teenagers in the art classroom for three decades. And I started my last, uh, the last 10 years that I was at North Olmsted High School, I started a glass program. There are so many different ways that you can express yourself in glass. Uh, you can paint with it, and that's what I do with all the frit here. Uh, when I do a workshop, we do painting in glass frits. They're not wet, but they're dry, and we use brushes, and I have a whole series of brushes and different tools that we use. Um, you can cut shapes out. Right now I'm working with uh, angel hair spaghetti. It's called stringers. And I also do screen printing. I take a photograph of my camera. Uh, I have an intern from the Art Institute who works in my studio. And then they alter the photograph under my direction so that we can screen print it onto glass. Keep in mind, they're all done by hand. And I'm an artist, I'm not, um, I, I love science and I love math. Those are not my strong points. So when I do something, no matter how hard I try, I can't do the same thing twice. Well, when my daughter was, um, she was going to go on a uh, bat mitzvah. And so part of that was a trip on the good time too. And I went along as a chaperone. And so we're going along the river and uh, I'm looking at all those bridges. But the key is, is that we're going under them. So it's an entirely different perspective. And I, I looked at those and I thought, I have to do something with this. So I had to wait a year before I could get to it. And then it took me two years to do the project. It just so happened that the day we went out, 
he, I had a new intern from the Art Institute and she was a photographer that I had requested. And so she assisted me in taking the photographs. We went out, I took all the images, and then we started getting those to the next stage, which is to create uh, the image on Photoshop, to manipulate it so it can take the technology that we're doing. And then we had to go to the next stage and to get it onto a screen. And then we have to print it and then fuse it in the kiln. And so each one of those steps, there are all sorts of things that can go well and things that don't go well. So, but eventually I got my additions and um, they've been very popular. My guardians of transportation, uh, the bridges. I do pendant workshops, I teach classes and eight week classes. And then my wife and I do a number of outdoor art festivals, primarily in Northeastern Ohio. Uh, we're at Kane Park, we're at Lakewood, uh, we go down to Hudson, we've been out at the IX Center by hand show. So it keeps me pretty busy. And then with our open houses here at the studio, it's a, it's a rich life. <laughs> I am enthusiastic about it and it's exciting. And when someone is really interested in what I'm doing, then I enjoy sharing that with them. And then when they actually make a purchase, it's always, ex it's, it's, it's really a high. And, and that's part of the whole cycle that an artist goes through, I think, is when the audience, whomever that is, appreciates and values what they're doing. For a list of his classes and to keep up with Daniel's projects, you can go to his website. Still to come, a dozen cars that were made right here in Lakewood. Well, Dave, I came to this place and I thought, looks like a candy factory to me, but they're, they call it a screw factory, right? That's absolutely true. But it says Lake Erie Building on the front. I come up here and I see these beautiful cars. Somebody said, we're made in Cleveland. I've never heard of a Templar. So what's the story you've been hiding here? Well, welcome to the Templar Motor Car Company. This is what this building was built as, a motor factory to build cars. So this is like an old time, old school Ford Motor Plant or Chevrolet Motor Plant or something, but it was Templar. 1917 and uh, uh, they started uh, with a group of uh, local masons, okay? All the management team over here, the signs, they're all Masonic guys that are Knights Templars, and hence the name Templar. Ah, that's oh, it. I thought okay. it was, There's it was no like, Mr. Templar. <clears throat> yeah, great. So it was, it's sort of like uh, Knights of the Round Table kind of thing. Absolutely, and if you notice the insignia is one guy on a horse, and actually Knights Templars is two guys on a horse because you vow your life to poverty. This was not this group. They were not poverty stricken, okay? These guys were the icons of the Cleveland, the titans of industry. Well, who's the titan who owns all these cars? That's what I want to know. I think you're talking to him. There he is right there. <laughs> hey, so check this out over here. This thing sure. looks really unique to me. It, it, is this the beginning of a car or is this like a roadster kind of thing or, or a frame of a race car? This is a roadster, believe it or not. Templar was an international company and they shipped uh, 1,200 cars internationally in 1920. They networked with their fellow Masons to be distributors worldwide. So the, the uh, trick question for the day is, how long does it take a <laughs> Templar to go around the world? From This went to Australia in 1920. More than 80 days. 85 years, came back in 2005. Unbelievable. Okay. Look at this fabulous stuff here, like this one here, the Model 445 Coupe, 1921, $3,785. That was a fortune in those days. That's 10 times the cost of a Chevy or a Ford. And this unique car is a car that was in Bill Harris' collection. It was number 705 in his collection. And this is a special car. I'm sure you've been to the West 78th Studios? Oh, sure. Okay. This body was built there. That's actually the Leon Roubaix company. And this body and that body were built by Mr. Roubaix. So this one here, this, you know, Roubaix sounds French to me. There's it is. There's something very French about the style of this car, isn't it? It is, there's suicide doors. There is this. Suicide doors, I love it. What a hot <laughs> ride. So there's these lower uh, uh, cuts here. But the big thing for uh, Templars is if you look inside this car, which is the most original Templar in the world and also the only sedan left. It has 375 miles on it. I love this color too. What's, it, what's this mustard looking machine? This is a, believe it or not, a four passenger sports car. And, uh, and, and they're sort of advertised as being a small car, the Templars, super right? Super fine small car. Super fine small cars. And this is a small car, but it's not that small. All the um, uh, wheelbases are the same, 118 inch, but the bodies are different. 
And Templar only built their motor and they, this is a, a neighborhood car. They built this car and they bought all the components in the neighborhood. The bodies, the, uh, Roubaix, Lang, Ohio Blower uh, mm -hmm. companies. So they would assemble these. So this, this car here, it looks like it's taking on a new style now. So what year yeah, are we getting up to here? That's a 1919 here? and it's a Touring. It's the biggest. It's got a big bonnet on it, okay? That's where you take your girlfriend out Absolutely. in this one, huh? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Do you ever drive these around? Yes, I had that one. I went down to Stan Hewitt. I had it uh, going 67 miles an hour down uh, you 70s. Rider, it you. was crazy. It was like driving a park <laughs> bench, okay? It was scary. How about this? This thing here is... This is a Sportette Deluxe. This, this is, is for the fancy guy. This is you. This is all you, okay? Thank you. And uh, it, well, it from really... From this day to this day. Yes, yes. There's no room to get in and out of these things. So you have what they call a fat man steering wheel, okay? Look at so that. you can get in and out. This is unbelievable. So listen, if somebody wanted to come here and see this, can people come here and see this and visit this collection? Yes, or we open up to the public three times a year. We open up during the art show. It's the first one coming up here in, in April, uh, next one in November, and then the uh, Christmas market in December. Because we're only scratching the surface here. I mean, I saw cases full of beautiful memorabilia. And uh, Dave, I know you can talk about these cars and with such passion. It's unbelievable. It's just well, terrific. The unique thing about this, Dave, is that they've come home. Okay, it's, it's a crazy thing. This is Lakewood's only car company, mm -hmm. and these cars have come home. They were made in this room. And we're like one of four facilities in the country that has that. I love it. It's amazing. It's fantastic. The passion of it and uh, the great collection, it's, it just takes my breath away. It's fantastic. Thanks. Thank you Appreciate very much. Your visit. The Screw Factory offers many opportunities for you to test your own skills. A lot of the artists, they offer classes as well. There's even a place where you can create your own perfume. Yates Perfumes and Apothecary is a small local, small batch perfumer within the heart of Lakewood. I hand blend and make signature perfume oils, um, offer perfumery workshop. And I also have a new thing called ritual oils, where they are essential oils blended with herbs for a specific intent. So the ritual oils can be for meditation or full moon oil or for sleep. Um, so it's kind of a multitude of scent oriented um, things that Yates Perfumes offers. I left my job back in 2010 after the birth of my youngest son. I spent 13 years in nuclear medicine. After nuclear, um, I was a stay-at-home mom with my kids and was lost and frustrated and kids are screaming and crying and my husband says to me, what makes you happy? And perfumes and scents has always been a part of that, for me at least. And then the chemistry aspect of blending also made my nuclear brain happy. So it kind of all just came together. So when it comes to making your own perfumes, you need what are called perfume notes. And, and if you go to yatesapothecary.com, you can select um, from a whole bunch of different type of workshops. You would sign up, it's $35 per person. Um, everything is included and you make and take two bottles of perfume. So then you take your little oil and you give it one drop on the thin end. It's a guided workshop where you'll learn about the basics of perfumery and then you get to experiment for yourself and learn how notes come together. A girlfriend of mine last month blended a perfume and it ended up smelling like a roasted turkey leg. So it's being open to the fact that when you put notes together, things will change and you'll have a different perfume at the end of four to six weeks. But it's all about being willing to experiment and have an open mind to sense. Lavender and cucumber. So if you like fresh notes, cucumber is a really nice one to play with. The oils need to macerate, so it's like a fine wine. Anything that needs to age, the notes will change over time. Certain notes will play well with each other, certain notes won't play well with each other. So you won't know what is at the end until four to six weeks after you blend. I have the eight perfumes that I sell that the studio is open to coming in and smelling and trying things on. I also offer custom perfumes too. If you have an idea and you want a one-off perfume that only you wear, then I would do a one-on-one -on -one consult and we would create a custom perfume. The signature perfume oils are all numerically named, so they have um, significance to me or my family. Um, one of them is Yates' birthday, and Yates was named after my chocolate lab. Um, one is his birthday, one is my son's birthday, one is an anniversary, one is my father's birthday, so they're all numerically named. There's a multitude of perfumes outside of Sephora and Ulta and Target or wherever else you can buy scents that there is an option where you can come and make your own. 
and get to experience what it's like to put notes together. YatesApothecary.com is the place where you can go to find out more information and also to see a list of upcoming classes. When we come back, our discoveries here continue at the Screw Factory. Welcome back to New Day Cleveland. We are continuing to explore a pretty unique factory here in Lakewood. Now home to a lot of different artists, including one that was an architect turned jewelry maker. I teach metalsmithing. I actually, I teach sort of to support my habit. <laughs> I like to make things and I like to make things out of metal and I like to make things jewelry. So. Um, it's, I'm in here almost every day, um, making, working on something or another, or teaching. Um, I also am on the road quite a bit, uh, so I teach, I've taught internationally, all over the country. It kind of evolved, so everybody that makes jewelry kind of starts with beads. And so that's where I started. Um, it was actually when my kids were in junior high, we started making beaded jewelry together. And then um, I got really hooked on it. So um, I had a little change of career plan and I opened a bead shop and I ran Grand River Beads in Rocky River for eight years. And then um, I, over the course of that time, I took some classes. Um, I watched a bunch of YouTube videos and I learned how to work with metal. So actually in between there was a little bit of wire working too. But then the metal um, sort of is where I'm parking because I really like just working with metal. And I started out with copper, doing a lot of cold connections, and then I moved over to um, silver. And I'm just now starting to experiment a little bit with gold. <laughs> Well, one thing, I have insomnia a lot, and so sometimes when I can't sleep, I engineer projects in my head. Now, they don't always turn out the way that I think that they will, but um, sometimes they do. And so, um, and there's a, a lot of inspiration out there. I mean, we have Pinterest and Instagram and blogs, and you know, you go online and um, you're just not lacking for uh, inspiring ideas. The actual construction is sort of um, secondary. I like figuring out how to do it and then um, making it and seeing if I need to change it or if it works the way that I thought. Um, in my former life, I was an architect, so I built a lot of models, and part of that was, you know, engineering the components and putting them together. And a while ago, somebody showed me how to do, it's called pour painting, and basically you mix paint with some mixatives that make it a little bit more um, fluid, and then it just, but it doesn't mix together. So it's just a style of painting that's kind of fun and um, not technical, doesn't require a high degree of um, artistic skill, and so it's just sort of a hobby. Teaching has sort of become, um, like I said, a way to support my artistic life, but surprisingly I've really come to enjoy it. Um, the creative interaction between students and like-minded people is very stimulating and students probably don't know this, but we instructors, we get almost as much inspiration as we hope we give to them. Because <laughs> just the exchange of ideas in an artistic environment is always um, just very stimulating. Well, I'm doing what I really, really love. I, I actually liked being an architect, but um, I didn't like jump out of bed in the morning and you know want to get to work here. I really, I look forward to coming in here. Um, there's always something to do. There's always an idea to experiment with. So, um, you know, it's just, I really enjoy it. You can learn more about Grand River Bead Studio online, and that's also where you can find a list of upcoming classes. Brett, I'm glad I found you because here at the Lake Erie building, or is it the Screw Factory, what do they call it? Yes, they call it both, but the Screw Factory most of the time. I call it being lost because it's, I don't know how many thousand square feet there are here and how many different guys are here doing stuff. I mean, it's jack-of-all-trades kind of place, but you're the t-shirt guy. I, I'm the t-shirt guy. Okay, yep. 717 Inc., what does that mean? Uh, it comes from our college address where my partners and I started the business, so um, 717 South Main Street down at Miami University. Oh, so you guys were just sitting around late at night, We whatever. had to come up with the name, so yeah. Yeah, you had a pizza going on. Yep. And t-shirts are happening. Now, when I was a kid, I remember Daffy Dan, that's a guy that started a t-shirt kind of sure. business, and it's evolved so much since then. So. 
What's happening here? How many t-shirts, who do you represent, and how does this whole thing work? Well, we have a couple brands that are represented here. Um, uh, we have a brand called University Tees that sells a bunch of college campuses. Uh, we sell direct to uh, local retailers, and we also uh, sell to like local businesses, breweries, uh, restaurants, and all of those come to, to print with us. So. Okay, I got an idea. The idea is Mossman Cooks. So if I want to put that on a t-shirt, how do I go about getting a t-shirt like that from you guys? We'd, we'd connect you with our brand on point, which would work direct, directly with you, and we could do a one-off shirt, or we can do as much of, uh, so, you want to do 100 of them, however many you want to do. So one-off is one shirt? One shirt, yep. And how much would one shirt cost me? Oh, they, well, they all range, so it depends on the price you want to pay, so it could be up to 50 bucks for a shirt. Could you be, size me up when I come in, see how thick my pocket got, is. Exactly, <laughs> that's, that's how you do it. Well, I see a lot of guys working here. How many different projects you have going here? How many different kinds of shirts? Well, uh, we, we run two shifts here. Uh, we have five automatic presses, we have three manual presses, and overall, within all the brands, there's about 175 people that work here. It's amazing. And are, there, are you working in conjunction with other companies too to help you do the marketing and the sales and all that kind of uh, stuff? We do at 717. We're really behind the scenes, so you won't really hear not us anymore, on the, on the you're market. Not, you're out in the open now. <laughs> um, so we work we work closely with partner partnering with other companies that you might hear um, more frequently with. So. Yeah, because I because I see uh, movie companies have T-shirts, baseball teams have T-shirts, colleges have T-shirts. So how many? What's your range of places that buy your stuff? Oh. Uh, it, it, it hits all of them. Like like I said, we're, we're behind the scenes as a decorator who's really just doing the decorating, mm -hmm. but we sell uh, all across the U.S. Uh, there's about, University Tees is on about um, 300 some schools and universities. We work with a variety of promo companies that print for, you know, the moving guys or the restaurants or wherever it would be. And I know in the old days they did uh, like uh, silk screening or something like that, mm -hmm. or you know, some things are iron on. Like, what do you guys specialize in? We do um, we do uh, screen printing, embroidery. Uh, we do the iron on, which we call heat press uh, application here, um, and that pretty much covers the gamut of, of what we do. It's fun to see all the different machines here, and I imagine one thing I, I don't. I thought I'd hear music here. I thought there'd be like music in here because it looks like a happy crowd. Well, we told the boys to turn it off and uh, you know make sure that they were um, representing for the for the camera today. So. They knew New Day Cleveland was coming. Yes, I got to tell you, for New Day Cleveland, the Screw Factory has been such a great surprise, a fantastic thing, and uh, congratulations on your business. Thank you very much. So this is really one of those things where a couple college guys got this great idea and they turned it into reality. That's that's true. It's exactly. a home run. Home run. No, okay. Hey, guess what? We have a whole bunch more coming up from the Screw Factory after the break. Welcome back to our road trip here at the Screw Factory in Lakewood. This stop is a must stop in my opinion. You might have seen this product already on Amazon. I'm talking about Defense Soap and Guy here is the creator of this. Where did the concept come from? It came from my youth wrestling team. That's where it started, your youth wrestling team. And I, it's expanded to, I mean, it's booming your business. Well, there was a need for it. We, um, we coach wrestling, we have a lot of little kids. Little kids get ringworm. So we developed a line of soap to help prevent ringworm. So that's how it started. Yes. But now this is soap that's not just for ringworm. I mean, this is used, this can be used by anybody. Yep, it's used by a lot of people. Pretty much any skin condition we could help out. Natural products are what you're using. Yep, all natural. So when it comes to, say, your soap, what are some of the things? Are we allowed to know? Is there a secret recipe? Are we allowed to know what you're putting into your soap? No, no, it's a tea tree and eucalyptus oil and an all natural base. What really helps, though, is what we don't have in our soap. We don't have colors, chemicals, you know, perfumes or dyes. That, that type of stuff is what causes a lot of skin conditions. We don't have any of that. So you started with the soap and you've expanded quite a bit. Yep, we've grown. Okay, so when it comes to some of the products that you have, body gel is a big is a big one for you. Yep. Now, you sell it in huge tubs or small ones because who's buying the big ones? Well, we'll sell uh, like 30 gallon drums to like universities or military, uh, Annapolis, schools. I mean, so when you think about it, there are so many different uses. Now, there's another product that you have that is an antibacterial product that you can use for a variety of things. Our antimicrobial spray is hypochlorous acid spray, which hypochlorous acid sounds really terrible, but that's what white blood cells produce to fight infection. And what we did is we took that hypochlorous molecule, put it in a water molecule, and then when you spray it on your skin, it, it kills any microbes it comes in contact with. And the interesting thing is there's so many markets for that. I mean, 
cows. Cows, yeah, dairy industry, um, tattoo industry, obviously the wrestling industry. Breastfeeding? Mother, breastfeeding, yeah, very big one. So you, I mean, when you think about the use that, I, I just, it's mind blowing. And you, you think about this for you, that's probably so exciting to know you started off with this one product and now you expanded to this amazing line. Yeah, we, we only make products that we believe there's a need for. So it makes it very easy to grow when there's actual need for and people want it. I heard, ladies, not just men, I heard that you have, a, it's a shaving soap. Yep, we have a sh new, new shave bar out. And it's a uh, really high fi fat content. So not only the guys like it, but a lot of ladies like it because uh, they don't need to, if they shave their legs, they won't need to use a lotion when they're done. It has a high fat content. So like whenever I send a bar to like one, a wrestling coach or something, the wife always steals and <laughs> I have to send another bar to them. It's kind of right, fun. so you gotta get another one out yeah, there. Yeah, I send two at a time now. You have to. Yeah. Detergent, you have detergent now that yeah. you do. We have a laundry additive that uh, works really well. And it's uh, it takes odor out of, like, like this type of material or starts mm -hmm. to hold odor, that's bacteria. We're able to remove that odor. And I, you really have thought of everything. I know certain bars you, you said are great to use, but say if a woman is pregnant, she can't use that one, you switch her to another one. Yeah, we have a, a FDA salicylic acid bar that's coming out. And uh, if you're pregnant or you're breastfeeding, you shouldn't use that bar. So we have a natural formula that they could use instead that is an oatmeal base. So it's a great exfoliating bar and it'll still give you the same results. Now, how'd you do this? I mean, when, I mean, look, this is a former Cleveland police officer. You were on the force how many years? 25. 25 years. You started this in the process of still, you were still an officer while you started yeah. this. Where did it start? In your, in in your my, house somewhere? In my basement. In your basement? Yeah. But it, again, it all started because you, you had this issue with the kids. You're a big wrestling coach and you found the need. I wouldn't say I'm a big wrestling coach. I'm well, an overweight wrestling coach. I, I get a, out of here. <laughs> You're a great wrestling coach. I am a wrestling coach. coach <laughs> but uh, I have about 100 kids in my program. And, you know, at one time, every single one of them had a ringworm. So I'm like, why didn't somebody just create a soap to get rid of ringworm? And no one did, so I did. Now, I want to I wanna give you a little bit of credit here. I was looking on Amazon, and you are, when it comes to, like, top sellers of any kind of soaps, you're up there in the top 10. Yeah. And you, he beats out like Dial, is it? You beat out Dial, yeah. like mm. Yeah, Dial, Irish Spring, Ivory. We do pretty, we beat those guys, but Dove still beats us. We're, we're gonna get Well, you'll those. get there. One you'll day. get there. One day we'll get there. I'm impressed. I love that you're right here in Lakewood, but your, your product shipped all over the world. They can find you on your website, right? Yep, defensesoap.com. Check them out. I gotta give you a high five. I'm really impressed by this okay. place. Cool. All right, David, I know he's finding something pretty interesting here too. Just when you thought you've seen it all, we stumbled onto a toy maker, and this is his story. If it's three-dimensional, I do it. That's why I need all the space, because when you, get, you work in three-dimensional, everything is three-dimensional. So not only making the piece itself, but then I also have to make the molds and either a resin casting of it or whatever they want the material in. I've done everything from very realistic, like Steve Irwin and the animals that I used to work for, to, that I freelance for a toy company now, to very uh, strange things, like I did a couple of the minions for a float that I worked on. I did a realistic uh, red-tailed hawk, and when I put it in the mold, it worked out beautiful. I got a nice casting, but when I took it out of the mold, it all fell apart. The only thing I had left was the head of the hawk. So I'm figuring out what can I do with this head of a hawk. I got wood all over the place. I got black walnut and I had this beautiful piece of cherry. And I thought cherry, red wood, red tailed hawk. So I put the two together. I made the body in a very uh, abstract, more of an abstract shape to bring out the texture and the coloring of the wood itself. Instead of trying to go back in and carving, I figured just, you know, God did a better job than I did on this wood. So then I started taking other things that I had done and sculpting other things like the owl. It's a great horned owl with a black walnut body, which is kind of brownish, and everything's like kind of it's got feathers on it with the texturing. I've had things that have taken me a couple hours to do and things that have taken me a month to do. Things like the, the animals, I would say average on those probably around a week to two weeks, depending how much detail. Some of them, like you do a whale, 
then you sand it down and you got the smooth surface. You're doing an animal with fur on it, you're there ticking away little lines of fur because you want to do it highly realistically because they're being sold in uh, museums and uh, zoo gift stores. The fairy garden stuff. Well, my wife, about nine, ten years ago, we were down in Amish country. My wife saw us a little container and had these little things in there and some fairies in that. She thought it was really cute. So she says, you can do these, which I did. So I took some ideas that she had and we started making them and putting them online. People liked them. So we met at art school, so she's an artist also. So she knows what she wants and then she paints them. She does all the online work, putting them on Etsy and, and that. Probably the Steve Irwin piece was, I guess it was probably the, the nicest piece to see finished. Because his wife and kids came here and she was the one that did all the business. He put the okay on it just before he died. So uh, we want to go ahead with it. So just seeing that in the box with his voice on it, that was nice. And then it goes to the large pieces, like the elephants up there. And those are made out of in two inch thick insulation foam. The sheets that you get in Home Depot, glue them all up into the size that you need, lay it down there, cut it all out, and then just start going in with um, saws and everything else. It's very fulfilling for me, because when I was going to art school, uh, I was intending on being a pen and ink artist, illustrator for books. And I started working in, uh, we had a project in three dimension, and I found that I had more of an aptitude for seeing things in dimensional than I could seeing them flat graphic wise. I always had a difficult time seeing in a flat. But even looking at a painting in a museum, I think of how could this be sculpted? So I'm always thinking dimensional. Uh, that probably drives some people crazy because I'll be sitting in a, a corner or something, I'll be looking at people and looking at their face and I'll be taking my little tool and trying to copy their face in my mind. So. Rob and his wife sell the fairy gardens on Etsy and of course you keep up with their other work on their website. Coming up after the break, pottery with a dragon theme. Through the halls here of the screw factory you'll find a lot of studios filled with ceramics the one that caught our eye has a pretty big dragon outside of the door uh, the name of my studio is do no sakebi which in, um, in english means call the dragon and I do pottery and blacksmithing right now. I lived in Japan for 18 years and that's where I started pottery. That's where I took my first class over there with a Japanese master and I did pottery for close to 15, 16 years over there. And I just decided I wanted to give the, the studio a funky name and call the dragon. I make lots of dragons. <laughs> my average day, there is no average day. <laughs> there really isn't. An average day in the studio, um, it depends. If, if I come in and I don't have anything ready to fire or whatever, we start on the wheel. Um, just get some clay wedged up, get it prepared, and then I uh, take it to the wheel, work things. You can see some of the, the things I've done back there. And then they have to dry, about half, about half dry, then I can trim them, finish them up. And then they just need to completely dry before they can be fired. So some days I'll come in, I'll have fired things that are ready to be glazed. So I'll bring everything out of the kiln in the morning, glaze those, throw them back in the kiln get back on the wheel and do stuff. With the blacksmithing, the, the forge is at home, it's not here in the studio. Sometimes I'll have a half day, I'll get the kiln going, get that started and head home and start doing stuff uh, in the forge. Actual hands-on time for something simple like this, it's, you know, it may be a matter of minutes. Um, when you're working on something like this uh, with a little bit of the dragon tail coming out of it, there's, this part is done on the wheel, but then this part is hand-formed, so that takes more time. Um, some of the bigger sculptures I have will take hours and hours to do. I love doing the dragons, so it's just kind of like whatever, and, and my dragons are kind of fun and, and, and playful, so I like to have them doing different things, like just peeking out of an egg like that. It's just, to me, that's, I, I like doing that kind of stuff. You have these snowmen here, which, these I call the melting snowmen. So the inspiration is, I just, I just like to have fun. I like to, I, I, would, I would say that. And, 
A lot of my stuff has a Japanese aesthetic to it. I'm, I'm, I'm still learning. <laughs> <laughs> Every day, I hate centering on the wheel. There are certain aspects of it that just are a little more difficult. But I start, like I said, I started in Japan. I had a year-long formal class, and the rest of it was pretty much self-taught. I worked with another Japanese potter for 15 years in a, a, the second place I lived in Japan, and just just learning from him. And, and that was it. Just trial. A lot. Some of it's trial and error. What, what I like about art is that. Sometimes I can combine things. It's not just because I'm doing clay doesn't mean I can't combine it with steel. Like some of, there are a few of my pieces, my clay pieces that have steel, but some of the dragons have steel earrings and, and other things. So it's kind of fun sometimes to combine it and do something different. I just hope they appreciate that it's handmade, um, that it's not mass manufactured, um, and that they, that it, it just, it just strikes something in their heart that they, they really like that piece, and I think a lot of people do. They, I get a lot of repeat customers. Like a lot of the others featured in today's show, the best way to keep up with Matt and his projects and even his classes is online. Well, anyone that knows me knows I'm not speechless very often, but David Deming, walking into your studio here at the Screw Factory, we can call it the Screw Factory, right? Sure. Yeah. yeah. To walk into your studio here, it's like breathtaking. It's unbelievable. <laughs> so this is all sculpture made from... Oh, I work in all kinds of materials. Uh, I do a lot of welding. So uh, when you see the dog sculptures here, those are all made out of uh, sort of found welding parts. and. You know, the muzzles are the caps of oxygen and acetylene tanks that I cut up and, you know, put together. So I use rebar and all kinds of things, so. It's so strange to walk in and see things that are as delicate as the human form, the faces. Mm -hmm. A few naked ladies around here, too. A few naked ladies. A few yeah. naked ladies around here. <laughs> and uh, baseball players. In fact, I think I've seen some of these baseball players uh, at the ballpark. Right, yeah. I've done all the Indians players except for the Bob Feller that was done some 30 years ago or so. Uh, but uh, Lou Boudreau, uh, Frank Robinson, Larry Doby, and Jim Tomey. Yeah. And uh, just did Jim Brown for the Browns uh, couple. That is unbelievable. So, so you get all these delicate, beautiful, fine human things, yeah. and then there's nothing left for junk here because you find some something that looks like <laughs> something go in the garbage, you weld it together into something. I recirculate a lot of stuff. I saw yeah. a dog with a hammer for a tail. Sure, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. so you're a man who not only is an artist and you do this for a living now, but you are also a man who taught students how to do this. Yeah, I, I had a nice long teaching career, mostly at the University of Texas. Uh, I was there for 26 years. And then I got, a, I got sucked into administrative things and ended up being the dean there and then came back to Cleveland because I was uh, asked to be the president of the Cleveland Institute of Art, which is my alma mater. So That's great. I did that for 12 years and decided that uh, our building project that we were doing at that time was far enough along that I could leave and know that it was going to get done because I wanted to be in my studio full time. So It's fantastic. Yeah. I saw Superman in the other room. We hope that Superman eventually happens. <laughs> you know, it should. It's, it's, he was born here. It's in the city's hands. They, yeah. They're trying to refined another site for it. The site that we had uh, sort of went away. So This is talking about sites that go away. You know, this building was a, a center of great industry at one time and then went yeah. to sleep for a while. Yeah. And for you to find it, to put find a home for your stuff, I mean, this is pretty important. Yeah, when, when I was actually uh, retiring from the Cleveland Institute of Art, I had a studio on the east side. Um, and one of my friends that taught there lives here in Cleveland, or in Lakewood. And uh, I grew up in Lakewood, so uh, he told somebody in the city here that I was looking for a studio, and they jumped on it and showed me this building, and I went, oh, this is a perfect place, because I make a lot of noise. There are some 40 other artists. Oh, you do make a lot of noise. Yeah, there are that. some 40 <laughs> other artists in this building, and they're all upstairs, yeah. uh, and usually with open ceiling studios. Yeah. And they showed me one of those, and I said, well, if I started working in here, everybody would hate me within 24 hours. You're a clanker. Because I'm a grinder and you know, I make all <laughs> kinds of noise. So they said, well, we know a spot for you. So 
Yeah. Hey, you got a place to work. We got to find you a gallery so people could see all your sure. stuff. Yeah. You want to do that, or, or you just you just want to work in? Uh, uh, well, I, I do show in galleries, and I have uh, one person shows yeah. uh, different places around the country. So. Um, but I am getting ready to have a show at the convention center uh, with a painter friend, Sam Roth. Uh, so we're going to be in there early May all the way through October. So we'll, it'll be in the atrium areas of the new convention center. And it's David Deming. And, and where do you sign your work? Any particular place all the time or different places? Um, it, 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 it depends on a, on a particular piece. Sometimes I hate touching the piece yeah. with a signature. Like messing know? it up. Yeah, it'll mess it up. You know, so uh, sometimes they try to hide it. Other times it's right there, you know, and some of them I weld it right on the base of the yeah. piece. You know. We shake that talented hand. Now that is a strong hand. When you see this <laughs> stuff, man, you know why. Thank you. So great to meet you. Good to meet you too. Thank and a whole lot more from the Screw Factory right after this. Welcome back to New Day Cleveland. We are continuing to really explore the Lake Erie building, also known as, of course, we've been saying, the Screw Factory, but this is now the Lake Erie room. And this is Hannah's space, so to speak. I know you really <laughs> make things come to life here. Yes. <laughs> this is the event space. Correct. Yes, we host um, usually one event per week, but we also do corporate events during the week as well. Um, weddings are predominantly what the we, big thing. Correct. That's what we're set up for today. Correct. Yes. Um, we have a That's ceremony a and reception space. So yes. you have enough room for the ceremony and the reception after. Absolutely. Yeah. Typically for weddings and receptions, 250 people works really well in here. Mm -hmm. For just receptions though, we could do up to 450 people. Wow. Yeah. Now the thing about this is you might be enticed by this room and if you are, you really need to think about booking now because how far do you book out normally? About a year and a half. So keep that in mind. <laughs> but I think there are so many perks to having an event here. One of them being most people can come in when they have their event on a weekend on Wednesday, the Wednesday before. Correct. To start setting up. Correct. So they'll have the space from Wednesday to Monday to do all of their setup and tear down. We provide all of the tables and chairs for them. We do floor length basic linens, uh, linen napkins, building staff and security is included in the rental fee as well. So it's kind of, it's a one, it's a one encompass rental fee. So you're not worried about, okay, well, how much extra is going to be here? How much extra is going to be there? Correct. Yep. Um, they do have to provide their own catering and then alcohol as well. Okay. Um, but they can use anyone provided that they're licensed in full service and then alcohol they can bring in their own. Well, and I think it's definitely a unique space too. And I'm yes. sure that you find when people walk in here, they're like, this is just different. Exactly. It's different. People can do what they want with the space. We don't have a lot of restrictions. So if somebody wants to do a bunch of florals or even hang things from the ceiling, we allow them to do that. Um, we've also had people go super simple and they'll use our linens and then just do a simple floral centerpiece. And you really can work them through all of that. Absolutely. We'll sit down with them usually about six months out to go over the details mm -hmm. with them. And then we'll finalize everything usually two weeks before their wedding. Now, is there anything I'm forgetting about the space that we want people to make sure they know about? Um, I don't believe so. I got it covered. <laughs> yes. Oh, all right. So, so there you have it. I mean, in when you come in here and you see the space, I mean, I was blown away by it. So mm -hmm. I think it's something come in here and see and hey, again, a year and a half fell out. So make sure you book now if you'd be interested. Thank yes. you so much, Thank Hannah. Thank you. It was so nice having you. Well, that's going to do it for our show here at the Lake Erie Building, also known as the Screw Factory. And of course, so many great people here want to thank them. And if you want to get in touch with them or explore some more of their work, just check it out online. And of course, if you're lucky, keep your ears open and you might hear about a couple of the events that are open through the year when you can come here and actually visit. So it's a fantastic place right here in Lakewood. On behalf of Natalie Herbeck, I'm David Moss. And guess what? We'll see you on the next New Day Cleveland.